This is a GSO 6-inch F12 classical caster grain telescope optical tube assembly. It sells for six to seven hundred dollars here in the US and today I'm going to review it. Let's see how it performs. So these things have been in the catalog for a few years now but for some reason this is the first one of these I've ever seen. You'll find the same product listed under many different nameplates depending on where in the world you happen to live. Most of the ones here in the US appear to be Orion branded version. This one is a GSO. But if you Google the topic, a six inch F12 classical caster grain, when I did this just a while ago, I came up with close to half a dozen variants with different names silk screened on this tube. They all appear to be the same product. So the price varies depending on who you buy it from and where you happen to live in the world. It may also vary based on certain accessories that are or are not included in the one that you happen to buy. So shop around and see if you can get the best deal. This GSO version sells for around $600 US and it comes with the optical tube assembly and these extension rings to reach focus. Okay, so there are actually many members in the Cassegrain family. The most common by far is this, the Schmidt Cassegrain, as you've seen, built by Mead and Celestron for many decades. The Schmidt Cassegrain is characterized by this flat looking piece of optical glass at the front of the telescope. It looks flat to the naked eye, but it's actually got a complex curve figured into it. You just can't see the figure with the naked eye. Again, this is by far the most common variant of the Cassegrain that you see today. Somewhat further in the distance is this. This is the Maxitov Cassegrain. This is a Mead ETX-125. A similar design, sort of, except it is characterized by its deeply curved meniscus plate. This one you can see the curve on very readily. So the Schmidt Cassegrain and the Mac are by far the most common variants of Cassegrains that you'll see today. Pretty far down in the distance, you'll see some of the others, including the RC, the Dahlkirkum, and this, the classical Cassegrain. So the classical caster grain is characterized by having no corrector plate at all. See, I can just stick my hand in here. There's nothing there. It gets everything done with two mirrors. The secondary mirror is hyperbolic. That's the complex curve. So it could be said that in a classical caster grain, the secondary is the one that's doing all of the heavy lifting for you. Modern versions have their own proprietary designs and the parabolic primary, which you find in a textbook classical Cassegrain may be slightly hyperbolic on its own. Again, many of these people have, you know, their own proprietary designs and they don't always tell us. At this price, it's very attractive. $599 to, you know, $700 or so US is a very low price for one of these classical Cassegrains. The last version of one of these I had in here was the Takahashi CN212. That one listed for well over $4,000. So the scope seems reasonably well made. Optical tube weighs around 12 pounds. Just be aware by the time you put everything on it that you need to have on here, you're gonna be pushing 14 to 15 pounds, kind of pushing the limit of a mid-sized mount at its focal length of 1900 millimeters. The tube is well baffled inside. There's a four stock secondary with three collimation screws and the primary has six collimation screws in the back. That's right, the primary is fixed. So those of you who don't like Moving mirror primaries like in a Schmidt Cassegrain or in a Maxitov Cassegrain, you don't like to see image shift. You're not going to see any of that here. There's also in the back a two inch GSO Crayford style focuser with a two inch adapter on it. And the focuser is also gradated so that you can measure where your eyepieces and your camera are. So the disadvantage of having the primary fixed is that this focuser actually has relatively little travel. It doesn't really have a lot here. You don't really get anything for free here. So if those of you who don't like the moving primary systems, you should know that there's an enormous amount of focus travel in a Schmidt Cassegrain and in a Mac. Those of you who run bino viewers and or focal reducers know what I'm talking about. So to compensate for that here, instead of having the primary move and having a limited amount of focusing travel here in the focuser, they give you these extension tubes. And there are three of them that came with this one. Two of them are one inch long and one of them is two inches long. So you can extend the back of the focuser by one inch, two inches, three inches, or four inches, depending on which ones you happen to stack on top of each other. Okay, so here we are with the scope mounted. 
And you know, I'm finding I have to say this a lot to beginners these days. If you're just getting started, you just buying the optical tube is just the beginning of you spending money. And in fact, you're not even halfway done here. You do have to get a mount for it. I'm finding a lot of people spend a lot of time shopping the optical tube and they don't pay enough attention to the mount. So the issue here is we have a telescope with a focal length of 1800 plus millimeters and a potential load of 14 to 16 pounds. You're gonna need a mount that's gonna be able to hold that steady and not shake on you. Not only that, it's gonna to have to be able to track the sky smoothly. And at 1800 millimeters, the sky is going to be moving on you pretty fast. So you do need a telescope specific mount to do those two seemingly contradictory things holding the telescope rock steady and panning smoothly across the sky. And this is the reason why typically photographic tripods don't usually work very well for astronomy. Fortunately, I think the audience for this particular telescope is going to be people who already have this material. And if you have all that stuff, the mount, you know, all the accessories, you're going to be fine. So this here is my Celestron AVX mount. Again, this was fine for general purpose viewing. They're around $900 US, I have two of them. I will have to say though, as, as I got to higher powers, 150, 175 power and up, it was actually happier on my bigger mounts. That's my Celestron CGE and the EM200, which you're kind of seeing half clipped out of the frame here. So for general purpose viewing, I found that either two or three of these one inch extension tubes were enough for me to do anything that I wanted to do with the telescope, either photographically or visually. So how are the optics? Well, this is okay, it's decent. I think this is a reasonable value for the money. It behaves like a six inch telescope, you know, should behave at around this price point. Am I jumping out of my chair? Not really, I think this is good. <laughs> I don't think it's great. Keep in mind, we are talking about a telescope that's in the semi-budget category here. So the owner of this scope keeps it in very good state of collimation. This is the Star Capella defocused, and you can see everything's nice and concentric. On the star test, it gives us a little bit to talk about. I think I'm seeing a little bit of overcorrection in the optics and a minor zone about two thirds of the way out. So the problem is when you have multiple issues, even when they're relatively small like this, they can interfere with you reading the mirror. But in any case, I didn't detect anything odd going on when the scope was in focus, so I wouldn't really worry about it. But if you're a real stickler, you should know that the mirror, at least on this one, is not perfect. So if we're observing, yeah, it's fine. I found the only issue I had was backing off in the magnification at 1800 millimeters. I'm more of a low power observing kind of guy. If I wanted to see all of the Pleiades, for example, I needed to back off to this 35 millimeter, millimeter panoptic. So the eyepieces I used most often were the 35 and 27 millimeter panoptics and the 13 and 11 millimeter Nagler type sixes. A couple of interesting things that I saw was the trapezium in the Orion Nebula. I saw all six stars. The first four are easy even in a small telescope, but F and E, the fifth and sixth components, can be tough. But with a 13 millimeter Nagler, good skies, they popped out quite nicely. If you like looking at star clusters, you're gonna like this scope. Star clusters seem very well framed at medium to medium high power, and clusters like NGC 7789 in Cassiopeia, and M35, M37, M36, and M38, that's the chain of clusters in the winter sky in Gemini and Auriga, also looked quite good. M35 showed its companion cluster, NGC 2158, Similarly, next to M38 in Auriga, NGC 1907 was also easily seen. So for imaging, if you like to do webcam, lunar, planetary type imaging, you're gonna like this scope a lot. I've got a bunch of these things lying around. Some of these are monochrome, some of these are color, some of these have bigger chips, some of them have smaller chips. They all work really well. If you notice, some of the very best people in the world at this use stock schmidt cassegrains or Max for their lunar and planetary images. On a recent phase of the moon, I put this one in the telescope and I got a couple of these images.
So for deep sky imaging, you know, it wasn't really designed for that, but I figured what the heck, I'll just go ahead and try it anyway. See, the problem is at F12, things start getting really slow. And so if you're imaging something that's dim, it's gonna start to struggle a little bit. But the Orion Nebula is not dim, so I thought, well, let's just give it a try. So this is an image of the Orion Nebula with my DSLR, straight through, no coma corrector, no field flattener whatsoever, and it's not bad, it's okay. Trying the Horsehead Nebula, which is nearby, you start to see it struggling a little bit at F12. You start to have to do things like raise the ISO or raise the exposure time, which starts to introduce some noise into the system. I mean, this is okay, it's not great, but again, it wasn't really designed for this. Okay, so sometimes I get questions from time to time. Can you use these telescopes terrestrially to take pictures during the daytime, essentially using them as telephoto lenses? And what I usually tell them is the standard boilerplate statement that if you really want to do this, you want to get a first-rate refractor and a dedicated field flattener. On the other hand, you know, I haven't actually done this in a while, so I thought, let's just go ahead and run a test and see what happens. So I brought all three Cassegrain-type telescopes with me, the C6 Schmidt Cassegrain, the Mead ETX Mac, and the 6-inch Classical Cassegrain. We're going to take pictures of that silo in the distance, and let's see what happens. So I took several imaging runs over a couple of days and picked the best samples from each scope. So first of all, you'll notice that none of the telescopes filled the frame of a full-frame sensor on my Canon 6D. So if you do this with one of these three scopes, you are going to have to crop out the center. So the Celestron C6 is the sharpest of the three by far, but only in the center. The further away you get from the center, the less sharp things get. On the ETX-125, a little less sharp overall, but impressively flat over the field. So those of you who have followed me over the years have noticed that I'm not exactly a fan of these ETXs, and this is at least part of the reason why. This sample, at least, has an enormous amount of image shift in it, so much so that it makes fine focusing impossible. I had a friend take off the plastic visual back on the stock scope. That's a piece of equipment I really don't like, by the way and he machined a bracket that allowed him to put a William Optics Crayford style focuser on the back. That way I can coarse focus with the stock focuser and then fine focus with the William Optics focuser. And to give you an indication of just how much focus shift there is, this is me just turning the focus knob a quarter of a turn in each direction. Contrast this with the Celestron C6, which has impressively little focus shift. No point in repeating this experiment with the classical Cassegrain because it doesn't focus by moving the mirror. The classical Cassegrain, a little bit between the two scopes. It's not quite as sharp as the Celestron C6, but it's sharper than the ETX-125. It has a flatter field than the Celestron C6, but not quite as flat as the ETX-125. So on the positive side, the scope is decent, it's good, it gets the job done, it's a good value. This scope succeeds by not doing anything wrong. And in today's world, that's an accomplishment. So there were little things I could complain about. I did get a little bit tired of screwing and unscrewing those extension tubes. I wish it were lighter. I mean, little things. This dust cap here is cheap and it's not very well secured and it fell out all the time. But overall, again, it succeeds by not doing anything wrong. On the downside, and some of this is subjective, I have to say, I can't really recall anything about the experience with this telescope. As the nights wore on, as the weeks went on, I found myself less and less excited towards using this thing. I kind of knew what it would do, and you know, I started to use it more out of duty than of anything else. Again, some of that is subjective. Perhaps the worst thing about the telescope has nothing to do with the scope itself. It's not its fault. You see, for about the same price, you could get a conventional schmidt cassegrain from Mead or Celestron. It does about the same thing. It's a smaller tube. It's lighter. A, a six-inch Schmidt Cassegrain weighs seven to eight pounds. This thing can weigh 14 to 16. So the lighter Schmidt Cassegrain will present less of a load and less of a problem for whatever mount you happen to be using. Also, Mead and Celestron have spent decades perfecting those Schmidt Cassegrains to the point where they're very intuitive and easy to use. These things, relatively low production numbers, relatively new to the catalog, so compared to the schmidt cassegrain this model, a little bit awkward, a little bit clunky, a little bit unrefined. So there's no reason why this shouldn't be your first telescope or your only telescope, but I have a feeling that the audience for this particular model is going to be experienced amateur astronomers, 
people with larger collections or people for whom they've always been curious about a classical Cassegrain, but they haven't been able to afford one until now. So I hope this has given you some information to decide if this model is for you. As always, the choice is up to you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.